Oh, John, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I will get, I, I, yep. Okay. Well done. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Monica. Um, it's kind of like old home day for me. Um, after all these years, I seem, it seems I can't get away from Alaska, from the Arctic Refuge, and from environmental activism. So it's, it's my honor, my joy to be with you and, and all the participants. Um, I am speaking to you from the homeland of the Lipan and Mescalero Apache. And I would like to dedicate the readings I'll do this evening to Adam Colton. Thank you. At the beginning, as people were gathering and logging in, um, just playing one of your pieces titled In the White Silence. Um, do you want to share a bit for the folks what inspired it and what that piece is about? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, it was inspired by the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and my travels in the refuge beginning in the uh, mid 1970s. Um, for me, it is the, the, the holy land. And um, I've been fortunate to spend a, a good deal of time there in that geography of hope through the course of my life. Uh, Cindy and I actually had our wedding ceremony in the, in the refuge. And uh, In the White Silence is my love song to the Arctic. And as a friend, uh, Mike Dunham, the uh, arts editor of the, the Anchorage Daily News, once observed um, when he first heard In the White Silence, which dates from sometime in the late 1990s, around the turn of the century, shall we say, um, he said, you know, this music will one day be a kind of, of um, archaeological record of a landscape that no longer exists. And boy, I think it was prophetic prescient um, as climate change continues to advance at an accelerating rate in, in ways that we couldn't have imagined 20, 30 years ago, and I think we still don't fully understand. Yeah, I agree. Um, and knowing that you got your inspiration for in the White Mountains and so many other pieces in the Arctic Refuge, I wanted to start our conversation tonight at sort of getting um, so you did spend, as I mentioned, uh, 40 years living in northern Alaska. But what first drew you? What first drew you north and what were your um, those first impressions? Of well, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a suburban refugee. I'm a child of the suburbs. I grew up uh, all over the eastern seaboard from, uh, of the United States, from, uh, from, from the deep south to the suburbs of New York City. My dad was climbing the corporate ladder with the phone company back when there was only one phone company. So it was a little bit like being a military kid. We moved every uh, three to five years. And I went to school in California and uh, Southern California. I was in the first graduating class at the California Institute of the Arts. And um, in 1973, oh. <laughs> um, another time, another place, but um, I think Southern California uh, made, a, made a composer out of me. Uh, it also made an environmentalist out of me. And without really understanding what was happening, I left there and I went looking for home. I realized uh, people would talk about, oh, I'm gonna go home. And I didn't know what that meant uh, because there was no place to which I felt uh, I truly belonged. And I had the supreme good fortune to come home and find my one true home at the tender age of 22 in 1975, it would have been, when I first set foot in Alaska. Well, a, a brave choice you made, but I think it uh, paid off in spades for you. <laughs> um, and so as you said, your time in Southern California um, helped shape some of your feelings and thoughts at, for environmental activism and, and conservation, mm -hmm. uh, which you did pursue once you did arrive home in Alaska. Um, and so, and you were working in conservation in a state which is with more difficult, maybe not, um, hasn't seen what the development could do like Southern California had seen already. And they were facing an oil boom in the seventies and eighties and especially with oil development. So 
set the stage. What was that like trying it was, to- It was a very different time and place. And um, what, what a wonderful, what, what a blessing it was to be a young person in Alaska at that time. Um, maybe with your indulgence, I'll, I think I've got a passage here that'll, that'll set the stage a little bit. Um, a passage from Silence is So Deep, um, put it in, putting it in sort of the larger historical context and some of the issues uh, that, that we were working on back then. Does that seem right? Would you that like sounds to great, this? yes. Okay, so then I'm just plopping down in the middle of this, okay? Following the first Earth Day, the early 1970s was a time of landmark environmental legislation in the United States. The National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, and an expanded Clean Air Act all passed Congress in relatively rapid succession. Alaska's native peoples had struggled for years to gain recognition of their indigenous rights. Finally, when oil was discovered at Prudhoe Bay, those rights began to be addressed. And in 1971, Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. The Native Claims Act also authorized the Secretary of Interior to withdraw large tracts of public land for environmental protection. Can, can you imagine? This was, this was the Nixon administration. That's how far yeah. we've come. Yeah. Uh, this gave birth to an unprecedented uh, grassroots campaign to preserve complete wild ecosystems in Alaska. The Alaska Coalition was a nationwide alliance of scientific, labor, and environmental organizations, as well as Alaska Native groups, dedicated to protecting the home ground of, of the Native people and their traditional cultures. Um, as an activist with the coalition, I gave interviews on television and radio to newspapers. I wrote articles and pamphlets. I organized, I spoke at community workshops throughout the country. I lobbied in Congress as I'm sure many of you do these days. Many elected officials stepped forward to provide leadership for the Alaska Wildlands legislation, most no notably Congressman Morris Udall and President Carter. I had worked on the Carter campaign um, in 1976 for this very reason, because of Alaska. And then just before Ronald Reagan took office as president, the leadership uh, pushed a compromised version of the Alaska legislation through Congress. And on December 8th, 1980, I'm sure you, you folks know this, um, President Carter signed the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act into law. Uh, it wasn't perfect. There were some serious omissions, most notably lack of wilderness protection for the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, leaving this priceless landscape open for oil and gas exploration. Even so, Anilka was the single largest land preservation law in history, setting aside 104 million acres of original Alaska. And with one stroke of the pen, it more than doubled the size of the national park system. This would be impossible in today's political environment, no matter which party might control the Congress or who might be in the White House. So when I first arrived in Alaska in the summer of 1975, it had been a state for just 16 years. The, it had the, the youngest and the fewest people of any state. The mean age of Alaskans was 28. The population was 376,000, a little more than half of what it is today. It's going back down at the moment. But <clears throat> Alaska was the richest state. It was the most educated of the United States. Despite its outsized geography, the whole of Alaska felt like a single small town. And in some ways, it still does, for better and for worse. <laughs> Uh, wherever you might travel in the state, you're always around people you knew. And even though you might have diametrically opposed worldviews, if someone was pulled over by the side of the road, people would always stop to offer help. The elegantly conceived Alaska Constitution set a broad-minded tone of open government. Traditional party lines didn't mean much back then. The governor, Jay Hammond, was a committed conservationist. Although he was nominally a Republican, Hammond's views on the role of government inclined toward a kind of democratic socialism. Representation in the state legislature encompassed a wide range of views and ordinary citizens had direct access to their elected officials. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline was not yet under construction. 
The Exxon Valdez was only a doomsday, doomsday scenario. The multi-year ice pack on the Arctic Ocean had not yet begun to recede, and global warming was still a theoretical possibility discussed only in the most rarefied scientific circles. Now, with the uh, in, in the in the early very late 70s, early 80s, with the money from the Trans Alaska Pipeline in full flow, the state of Alaska was filthy rich. And many politicians had big plans for that money. Our mission at the Northern Alaska Environmental Center in those days was to try and prevent them from realizing the worst of those plans. And my primary collaborator in that crusade was the woman who has been my life partner below now these 42 years, Cynthia Marie Adams. Um, it, was, it was really a different time. And um, we, we didn't know, no one told us that we couldn't do these things. So we just tried to do them. Yeah, I mean, I think um, not having a sting of defeat or a, like you said, not having a barrier already erected for what you can and can't do. Um, and I, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Anilka um, was, you know, in that time, quite uh, groundbreaking and impressive. Um, it was so thing thrilling, that just the idea, it, caught, it captured my imagination as it did so many young people. Mm -hmm. you know, the idea that you could preserve complete ecosystems. And we thought, of course, that we were going to lock them up and throw away the key and they would be protected in perpetuity. We couldn't have imagined that you know, pollution from the other side of the world would would start uh, making changes in these landscapes that we thought we had protected, changes we couldn't even, even have imagined at that point. Yeah. And one thing that struck me when you were talking is not only about kind of like the small, small town feeling that was all of Alaska back then, but also that community that you were working within. Um, mentioning the Alaska Coalition. Uh, so just so everyone knows on this call, that was, you know, the start, that was the the epitome of all of these groups and partners and business and nonprofits um, working together um, for a cause. And we still see that today with the Arctic Refuge campaign. And, you know, I mentioned you work for the Northern Alaska Environmental Center and they're one of our dear partners in Alaska still doing um, great work for for this for the refuge and for many other issues and so um just just wanting to illustrate sometimes how long a legacy and how long and um or how many ripples some of this work can have and for many that are tuning in today they've they've made the phone calls to their members of congress they've written the letters um and it makes you know, it makes a big difference and it's why um from 40 years ago to now, we're still working and able to do this work uh, and still have a chance at success. So that um, that was that's very neat for me to hear as someone um, came into the coalition <laughs> a little later. Uh, but you know, that being said, um, we are still continuing the fight. So it has not been easy. It has been a long road. Um, and it's against a fairly big industry, you know, big oil, which even in the last five years, we are seeing um, a lot of change within that industry. Uh, but as this has stretched on for decades, we we have a tendency and it's easy to forget all the wins and achievements, no matter how small or how great um, that have happened over the years. But as I mentioned, it's all those. Apologies, guys, my Internet may be going in and out. I'm seeing a couple of comments. We had some storms rolling in. Uh, I will try and pause <laughs> and let it catch up. Um, but um, so, yeah, so these successes, these small wins are kind of the reason that we're able to keep doing this work and striving for uh, our ultimate goal. And so just wanted to offer up, see if you had a moment of success or achievement while you were working in Alaska um, well, on these issues. Sure. Um... You know, I got I got my start as an activist um, with the Alaska Coalition. You know, what was I, 21? I, even before I went to Alaska, I had gotten involved um, with the coalition. Let's see. Are you still seeing me? Okay. Um, 
yeah, so I was just a kid and I got involved with, um, found myself, you know, lobbying in Congress about, about these um, federal land issues. Um, but by the time I was hired as executive director of what was then the Fairbanks Environmental Center, it was the, the, the legislation had not, ANILCA had not passed Congress yet, but it was already clear that we had done our, our grassroots job and we built this strong network inside of Alaska. But now everything was shifting to Washington, D.C. And <clears throat> as we began to see oil money flowing into the state, we realized, oh, we, you know, the people who are fighting the battles in Congress don't have time or money or, frankly, uh, even the awareness of the issues, the threat that the state of Alaska poses um, because of all the money that was coming in. So um, we, helped, uh, we helped keep um, state oil and gas leases out of the, um, um, out of the Chuck uh, Chukchi Sea, out of Bristol Bay. We stopped what they called in those days and maybe still call land disposals, if you can believe that. The state was parceling up, making subdivisions out in the middle of, of wild lands and selling them off, disposing of them to get money, as if they needed money, right? Um, but um, so there were, critical, there were critical habitat areas that were, th that were threatened with, with being chopped up and sold into, into private ownership. Um, and one of the most notable successes we had in those days was somehow we stopped the, the Alaska Power Authority from constructing the two largest hydroelectric, what would have been the two largest hydroelectric projects on planet Earth, back to back on the Susitna River. And I'm happy to say, although the idea has come back in recent years, it still, it still hasn't happened. Uh, we began to look at the, at the wildlands um, on either side of the Hall Road, um, the, the Pipeline Hall Road, which mm -hmm. you know called the Dalton Highway, and trying to keep those closed to sport hunting and uh, and and uh, off-road vehicle traffic, uh, because of course that corridor goes right through the middle of well, it goes between the Arctic Refuge and the gates of the Arctic National Park and and all these uh, the Yukon Flats, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. So as as the the, the Lands Act became the center of focus in, in Washington, D.C. We readjusted in Alaska and we said, okay, we are, we're going to have to take on these state issues that nobody else is going to be tackling. And we had some notable success. I'm not sure that that would be the case today. I, the state has changed a lot. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, not, not only the state, so has D.C. Um, has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great point and, and highlight, especially when we're talking about working in coalitions, working on issues that are so varied, um, and especially, uh, you know, for many of us, at least me on the East Coast, uh, far away. But one one area where the coalition has always succeeded is identifying roles and where where organizations and people are suited to use their voice and their strengths. And so, um, you know, Alaska Wilderness League when founded, decided to be based in DC to cover that aspect so that yes. others wouldn't have to worry. Um, and it's really without, without, that, without that coordination, I don't think we would have had, independently, any of us would have not had the resources to be successful. So it just speaks to work together for, um, on these issues is how- Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, uh, for, for better and for worse, the DC <laughs> is still uh, the center and, I, uh, and the capital, isn't it? Um, and even back in the day, in the area I'm talking about, you know, 40, 45 years ago, um, the grassroots network grew in Alaska. The, 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 the vision of the, uh, the Alaska Lands Act uh, was formulated in Alaska, but um, then it had to be, it was a national coalition of that scope had to be coordinated by, um, by a, an organization, you know, closer to the seat of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, these sweeping changes don't come about um, easily. It does take real national elevation as well, in addition, and that's where the voice of you know all of you on the phone today has really needed. And if you wonder why 
if you're in New York or California or New Mexico, why um, it matters to to use your voice on issues, national issues such as these. That's exactly why, because uh, it takes um, all of Congress to know that these are a priority um, and important to act upon. So I will say a big thank you for being part of our Alaska coalition <laughs> and helping us with all of this work. Um, so, so you succeeded, you got a lot done for environmental conservation, and then you decided to transfer and move out of the conservation realm and have give yourself an opportunity to really focus on your art. And, and so you went into a cabin, a, a small cabin. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, we did succeed, but then uh, we, we won a lot of small campaigns and, and some big ones, but uh, ultimately I'm not sure whether we actually succeeded. It's ongoing. I don't think it's, yeah. you know, it's ever finished. Um, but the, yeah, there came a time when I had to choose between a life as an activist and a life as an artist. And what precipitated it, there were many things. I mean, my, 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 my music was suffering, my health was suffering, my, my relationship with the love of my life was suffering. All these things um, were under duress from my round the clock uh, activism. But what really pushed me over the edge um, was when some people came to me from the Democratic Party and said, John, we'd like you to run for the for a state office, and I, I ran the other way. <laughs> I realized uh, in that moment that I don't have the the temperament. I'm fundamentally introspective. I'm an artist. The only thing worse than having an artistic disposition is thinking you have an artistic disposition. But it turns out I really do. And um, I just, I, I realized that I had to make the choice and that I quite frankly didn't have the courage or the stamina for a life as an activist. And, um, and so I took the leap of faith that in its own way, art, music could matter every bit as much as politics. And I have to say over the years, I know that I've made the right choice. And as I look at, at the larger arc of history, um, and this is in to no way uh, denigrate political activism because I'm still involved in it and I, my heart goes out to everyone who is trying to do good work in, in that arena of power. But if you look at the long arc of history, the ideas that change the world do not originate in political theater. They originate in creative thought. They originate in art and culture. They originate in the best of scientific thought and um, and in in a very narrow, for, from my perspective, a very narrow, but at times a very deep slice of religious thought also. Um, so I took that leap and I've been trying to make good on it ever since. Well, and I think this, you know, is just another aspect of what you had talked about when it comes to coalition work, because everyone has their strength and their purpose. And I, I am no artiste, but Without that, we would be missing notes. It would be flat as a cell. Look, we are, we are all, look, our, our, uh, if I had any hair, it would be on fire. Yours looks great today. It's on fire. Um, <laughs> our pants are on fire. The world is on fire. And we're all, I mean, in this pandemic, uh, you know, it's, it, we're all asking ourselves, oh, what's the best thing I can do? And that's all that any of us can do. And it's what's going to be required is for each one of us to ask that question again and again and again and, and, and find our answer and do that thing with, with all of our being. Or yep. we're toast. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I also have seen what it can do when we do all use our voices, um, which is- So have I. Yeah, it's the best, the best of all of us. Um, and just to share a little anecdote um, that kind of highlights your very deep connection to the Arctic Refuge um, is you had an experience in the Arctic Refuge. I don't know if many others have had, 
Um, and it's where you actually were married. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the wedding story? <laughs> I want the wedding story. <laughs> I'll give you the short version. Uh, there's a longer version. This uh, Silence is So Deep is, is, uh, the most, is my most recent book. It's the third, the third book. But uh, there's a longer version of this story in Winter Music, which was my first book. And, um, but I'll spare you that one, although it's, it's lovely. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm sure many of you know our, our dear friend, Debbie Miller, who uh, we call Preacher Miller. At the end of June, this would have been uh, 1989, Cindy and I had been um, together, on again, off again, at one another's throats, comrades in the, in the campaign and, um, and soulmates for 10 years before we finally um, decided to, to, to tie the knot. At the end of June, Cindy and our friend Debbie Miller decided to take their kids up to the refuge for a base camp on the Okpilak River, the river with no willows. I'd been commissioned to create a radio piece about the Arctic. So my pal Leif and I arranged to fly into Cindy and Debbie's camp to spend a couple of days before taking off on a backpack trip to record sounds. I guess I should set the context here. This was a moment at which Cindy and I weren't quite sure we were gonna continue. We were kind of taking a time out, okay? <laughs> so as I unloaded my pack from the plane, Cindy smiled sweetly at me and asked in her most offhand tone, so you wanna get married? Mustering all the nonchalance that I could, I replied, sure. Dennis, uh, Debbie's uh, then husband, was, he's a bush pilot. He was, he was in the refuge flying surveys of the porcupine caribou herd. The Arctic coastal plain is the calving ground, I don't have to tell you folks this, <clears throat> of, the, um, of the herd, which that year numbered 178,000 animals. A few days later, Dennis dropped in, landing in his super cub on the tundra to present us with a wedding cake and a couple of bottles of cheap champagne imported from Fairbanks, 400 miles to the south. We hiked across a small creek over the tundra, up a hill at the north end of the valley, where Cindy and I exchanged our vows. These were the endless days of the Arctic summer. The sun was low in the north and everything was bathed in deep golden evening light. No one had a watch, so we'll never know whether we were married on June 30th or July 1. We strolled back down to camp where we ate wedding cake, drank champagne, and danced around a fire we built on a gravel bar in the river. The sun disappeared behind a ridge. We put our kids to bed, returned to the fire, and began telling stories. Suddenly, something caught my ear. I ran up the riverbank to get away from the sound of the water. Cindy, Leaf, and Debbie followed. There, on the very spot where we'd spoken our vows, sat a lone wolf howling to the sky. Above the wolf, a pair of snowy owls circled in the cool air. I am not making this up. The rest of the story is, I, I looked at her, <laughs> she looked at me, she said, go. Ran to the tent, grabbed my recording kit, and I spent my wedding night with a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would sound unbelievable, but I, I say, you know, it happened in the Arctic Refuge, so of course it's completely Unbelievable, um, and that is awesome. And I think you you, you set the bar high there <laughs> uh, for wedding stories. Um, it's worked out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, sure, that's unique, and I think just help illustrate some of your connections to this place that have that inspired so much of your music and your writing. Um, but yeah, our our uh, our organist for the wedding for the ceremony was my Aeolian harp, which is, um, it's a wind harp, right? And, and the one I have that I would use in, in Alaska out in the field is about, you know, yay big, maybe three feet by 10 or 12 inches. And um, a wind harp 
is, uh, has a whole bunch of light strings, nylon strings, and it sings with the wind. And I would stand on the tundra with this harp on my head and turn like a weather vane trying to catch the wind so that it would sing with its fullest voice. And uh, that, was our, that was our church organist uh, for our wedding. And that experience of, of, of standing on the tundra with the harp on my head and feeling the music come from who knows how far away across the earth and, 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 and through the strings and sing and the sound going down my, through my body and back into the earth. That's been a touchstone for so much of my music over the years. Wow, yes, I can imagine. And um, <laughs> Bob was wondering um, if you at all incorporated wolves or even the essence of wolves after uh, that night recording into any of your compositions. You know, I haven't. It's it's really interesting. Um, it's not that I shy away from 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 stealing from from animals. I do it all the time. My life's work began with bird songs, mm. um, and um, and and bird song has been a perennial source for my music for you know for fifty years now. Um, but I'm I'm leery of more and more as as the work has has led me into, as the work has matured and, and, and I've grown as an artist, I am less and less interested in telling you a story or painting you a, 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 a picture of a, of a specific moment. I'm certainly not interested in telling you about my feelings or, or, or my experience of a place. For me, music, uh, I, I, I want for you, I want for you as a listener the same thing I want for myself as a composer as the first listener, you might say. Uh, I want to be in touch with something. I, I, music for me is a kind of wilderness. I want to be in touch with something that is bigger, deeper, older, uh, more mysterious, more powerful than I can imagine. Something that, that maybe is aware that I'm there, but um, it's not about me. Uh, it's about what I want for you as a listener is that you enter into this strange and beautiful and sometimes scary place the likes of which you've never been in before. And maybe if you're really lucky, you get hopelessly lost in it. Wow. Um, and I'm also seeing there's another question that popped up. You referenced bird songs. Um, yeah. Was that an influence? They were curious if that was a influenced by um, bird songs by Messian or if like actual, what you had to have bird song. <laughs> I've always been a contrarian and um, and you know, when I was 21 or whatever it was, when I began working with bird songs, I was even more uh, self-consciously rebellious and trying to reject all influences. So when I began working with bird songs, it was, um, I was it was after music school, and I was wandering. You know, I lived in rural Georgia, and then the Nez Perce Reservation in Idaho, and I knew I was making my way back to Alaska, but hadn't gotten there yet. Um, anyway, I was living in this old farmhouse in Georgia, and um, I was a farmhand. And I'd get up very early every morning before work and go out and walk the fields and woods. And there was this one particular bird song that just, it, it touched me in a way that uh, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't articulate in, in, in words or in tones. And in time I came to learn that it was the wood thrush, which of course, uh, was the favorite singer of the man who ruined my life, Henry David Thoreau. And um, so I determined that I was going to learn directly from the wood thrush and from the other birds singing on that farm. And there were not very many field recordings available in those days anyway, but I told myself, no, I'm not using those. I'm not listening, I'm not listening to Messian. Or, 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 or Couperin or any other composers who have ever worked with bird songs. I'm gonna study with the birds. So I'd go out in the fields, in the woods, in the mornings and again in the evening with my little notepad, my little musical staff pad tucked into my pocket and my pencil and sit down and listen as carefully as I could and try to write down something of what I was hearing. I admire Messian. Um, his birds are different than my birds. Um, 
Now I can listen to Messian and revel in it, but back then, no, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hear a note of anyone else's music except the wood thrush. And that, you know, Monica, that's been kind of my my um, delusional conceit my whole creative life. Um, I imagined, and Alaska really made this um, feel possible. Alaska and 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 some key people in my life, Cynthia, um, my dear friend Gordon Wright, the, the conductor of the Fairbanks Symphony um, and founder of the Arctic Chamber Orchestra, the poet John Haynes, uh, my, my, like my old brother, Barry Lopez, who, who we just recently lost. I've had these people and these places in my life that have allowed me to imagine that somehow I could, I could draw my music directly from the earth unmediated or as unmediated as possible by um, human history or culture. Patently absurd, ridiculous proposition, but it has served me well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the important thing was that you had that belief. You had, you were able to have that knowledge that. And this family, this family of, you know, my, uh, with whom I shared uh, love for this place and 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 ties deeper than blood. These people who believed in me and said, "Yeah, go do that. You need to do that for one another." <clears throat> in whatever um, way. Yeah, in any way. And I know through your work, as you said, um, and the ability to help bring about positive change and and influence positive change and, and change in people. Um, one issue that is both in the book um, and that we talked about is climate change. And particularly you even mentioned when you first arrived to Alaska, how very different it was. The ice pack, the multi-year ice pack was still there. Um, and just changes really like as a climate witness it, over your 40 years in Alaska, <clears throat> I wanted to have you share a little bit about kind of what you saw. Yeah, um, there's a section, um in the book that's called The End of Winter. And, um, you know, it's longer than I can read now, but um, it begins with uh, maybe the darkest moment in my life in Alaska in um, the late winter of 1989, when my dear friend Gordon had left and moved down to Anchorage and Cindy had decided, you know, this isn't working. We need to call it quits. This was six months before we decided to get married. <laughs> um, and um, then an Omega front settled in to Fairbanks. And um, it, um, there was a stretch of almost three weeks in which the temperature never rose above 55 degrees below zero at my cabin. And a neighbor back in the woods brought his propane tank into the cabin that exploded. I mean, just, you know, it, it gets, it, as, and as the days, as that, that cold went on and on and on, it just got more and more dangerous. And uh, it was terrifying. And then, you know, in the middle of that, Exxon Valdez happened. It just seemed like the end of the world. Um, and who could have imagined how quickly we would go from that kind of deep cold, which Alaska will now probably never see again, at least not in maybe perhaps for thousands of years now. Um, here's, I'll read you some of this little story and we'll, it's got some anecdotal um, evidence of, of sort of the signs that we saw early, right? It, it all, it, we all, we began to notice it in interior Alaska. And of course the interior is, is the, is the, historically the coldest, uh, driest uh, part of the state. And it was right around the turn of the century we started noticing. On New Year's Eve in 1999, Cindy and I, now my wife, hosted a bonfire at our house in the hills north of Fairbanks. As the 21st century dawned in Alaska, our thermometer read 57 degrees below zero. We and our friends reveled in it. But the following winter, the temperature in Fairbanks never reached 40 below. This was a first in the brief recorded history of local weather. However, it would quickly become the new normal. High temperature records began to be set with regularity. 
in both summer and winter. I remember the first time we saw lightning and heard thunder in December, which was followed by a heavy freezing rain. It had always been that the roads around town were better in the winter, when a hard crust of dry, compacted snow filled in all the potholes and offered plenty of traction. Now we had frequent freezing and thawing and treacherous glazes of thick black ice. One spring afternoon, while watching birds at a bog near our house, I was startled to hear the unmistakable call of a red-winged blackbird. This is a bird that I'd come to know first in Okefenokee Swamp, thousands of miles to the south in Georgia. It was certainly not a resident species of interior Alaska. Yet here it was. And ever since then, the red ones have appeared each spring in that same northern bog. Over the next decade, we, we saw the climate of Alaska continue to, continue to warm at an alarming rate in a very real way, the Alaska that we knew was beginning to disappear. Meanwhile, the wildfire season increased in length and intensity. And I think this is pertinent um, to what's going on now. Well, here where, where I am, California, Oregon, my dear friend Barry lost his home of 50 years um, to, to wildfire last summer. Mary Lopez, a prophet of, of climate change, died as a climate refugee. Um, but in, in 2004, the fire season lasted all summer. From June through September, temperatures soared. There was almost no precipitation. That summer, 6.3 million acres of Alaska, an area larger than the state of Vermont, went up in flames. In northern Alaska, Summer's the season of endless daylight, and yet day after day we didn't see the sun. The smell of smoke was omnipresent, the air was dangerously polluted, the public was warned to limit exertion, to stay indoors as much as possible. This is all familiar now. Uh, the Red Cross set up smoke respite centers to provide people sanctuary from the oppressive conditions. Many fled south in search of clearer air. In its magnitude and intensity, that fire season dramatically surpassed all those previous re re previously recorded, but subsequent summers have come all too close to matching it. And now that's that's moving south. You know, we drove we drove uh, like the year before, year or two before we left Alaska. Um, I had a performance, the premiere of Inuksuit, my big outdoor piece, percussion, it was premiered down in uh, Banff and uh, in Alberta, and we decided, oh, what the hell? We haven't driven the Alaska Highway in 30 some odd years. Let's drive to Banff. And we did, and we were stunned at um, the extent of the wildfires and also the extent of the, the spruce bark beetles just raging through the, the forests of interior British Columbia. You know, and this was, uh, I can only imagine how things look now. Yeah, and climate change is extremely daunting um, and impacts not only the work we do in Alaska, but um, you know, on, on all of our <laughs> public lands in, um, in Alaska, but also everyone at home. Um, and I know sometimes it can feel quite overwhelming uh, to try and solve, but um, you know, I think especially with this, knowing everyone who's on this call and knowing the work everyone is doing, I remain hopeful. Uh, we named this series Geography of Hope uh, for a reason. And I think it is important for us to all remember the work and our ability um, to achieve uh, great things when we do work together. And I know uh, you and I talked a little bit about this. And so I did want to make sure we ended kind of on um, a hopeful note in your mind and what you um, hopeful. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't seem to help myself. And maybe I'm not quite as hopeful as I as I was when I was younger. But what keeps me going um, as a human being, and as an artist, as a human animal, and as an artist, what keeps me getting up every morning and going to my studio with, um, with, with love and devotion and, um, and serious intent 
is my faith in the next generations. And um, this is the only piece, I'm going to read you a, a, a shortish piece in its entirety. Uh, it's the only piece that's not from Silence is So Deep. This is from a new book in progress. And it's, um, the, the book is called True Places. And um, it's, uh, the subtitle is uh, Searching for Home in the Anthropocene. And this is the epilogue. It's titled, it's a kind of a love letter to the next generations. It's titled To You. And it bears an inscription from the Cuban poet Pedro Salinas. Earth, nothing more. Earth, nothing less. Let that be enough for you. You and I will never meet, but you are always with me. When I'm walking alone, when I'm working in my studio, when I lie awake in the night, I think of you. The tenderness I feel for you gives meaning to my days. Imagining the world you will inhabit, the changes to the earth, the struggles you will face in your life, I can only hope that in the life that remains to me, I may be able to leave something that may be of use to you as you confront what seems to lie ahead. In the past, art had the power to startle us awake, to call us to attention, to provoke new ways of hearing and seeing. Now, in this time of constant crisis and commodified fear, it may be that the best art can give is the full expression of our grief and some measure of clarity, solace, and courage. Many who have come before have given me courage. Now, it is my turn to leave for you whatever modest gifts I may have to offer. And yet, as I act on my faith in you, as I work with you in my heart and mind, I realize that I'm still the recipient of the gift. It is you who give me the courage to continue. My generation has failed as custodians of the earth and as keepers of humanity. You now are the hope of the world. It is you who will lead us out of this darkness of our own making. You will live by the knowledge that this earth is our only home. You will stop treating the atmosphere and the oceans as dumping grounds. You will transform the economics of plunder into human communities living within the limits of biology. You will walk back from the brink of extinction. You will celebrate what it means to be human. You will remember that we are also animals and that our true nature lies in creation. You will reclaim imagination. You will remember truths that we have forgotten. You will speak ancient wisdom in new words. You will discover music that I cannot imagine. My dream has been to work on the edge of this culture of decay, to try and imagine a culture of renewal that I will not live to inhabit, to listen to the music of the earth, to learn from the birds and the wind and the ground beneath my feet, to feel my small fleeting presence within the immensity of deep time, to come home. I've sat in a forest learning the songs of birds. I have stood on the tundra with a wind harp on my head, feeling the breath of the world flow down through my body and into the earth. I've been almost swept away by the dark waves of a glacier crashing into the sea. In the stillness of the desert, I've heard the singing of the light. I've known places where I could imagine myself standing on the earth before we humans arrived and after we have gone. In the music I've been given, I hope you may hear some echo of this world I have known and loved so well. And perhaps that music may encourage you toward new visions of how the world might be and how we might find our true place in the mysterious matrix of life. Imperfect music and a few rough words are all that I have to offer you. I'm a man writing love letters to someone I will never know. I seal these notes in bottles and toss them into a, turning, in, into a churning sea, hoping 
that one day they may find you. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, I can't imagine um, more powerful words to to inspire us. And I know I'm to extremely take forward the give and leave of courage. I know I have been the recipient of many um, have provided courage to me and I will um, pay it forward as well, taking those words. Um, and the comments are, yeah, you, you've you moved us all. Uh, some pe- I, I'm on video, some people aren't, they're maybe a little more lucky. Uh, so uh, yes, thank you. And um, before we wrap up, I did to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Chris Konish, our Director of Development. Here, um, how you can get involved with us um, and learn more about the league. Thanks, Monica, and thank you so much, Sean, for, for all of that. I'm not going to even try to attempt to extend on, on that uh, <laughs> beautiful uh, message you put up forth, but I did want to share if, if folks are inspired by some of, the, some of the things we discussed, and I certainly have been, um, just a, a few different opportunities we have to ensure that you're getting involved in the effort to protect these places that we've talked about, getting involved to protect the Arctic Refuge, the Western Arctic, the Tongass National Forest. Um, and, and just really staying engaged in this work throughout, throughout our work, as it is not just uh, accomplished in a day, it is, it is always going to be, as we've seen, uh, sort of give and take. And right now we're an opportunity with a, with a large slate of um, great opportunities to, secure, to restore some protections to the Arctic Refuge. And one thing that is going to be able to help us push, the, uh, push us over the finish line is, is support. Um, as much as we love to... Uh, really thrive off the passion and investment and activism of, of, of everyone involved in this call, what we do still have lights to turn on, unfortunately. Um, and fortunately, uh, we have had some generous supporters who were inspired by their own trips to the Arctic Refuge um, with their commitment to protect the coastal plain to offer to match any gift made at this point up until June 10th. And so there's a URL here, there's going to be a link provided as well. We do hope that if you're inspired, Give what you can, give any amount, five to as much dollars as, as you can offer. It really makes an enormous difference in our work. So really appreciate anyone, everyone who stepped up already. Um, also encourage folks to just check us out and, and, and make sure that you're staying in, up to speed with us. Um, there's been a lot of news that, thro- that broke. There's, uh, if you go to the news site on our, our page, there's a lot of great coverage, including a couple of lead staffers, our conservation director, now acting director, um, Kristen Miller and uh, our legislative director, Leah Donahue, quoted in, quoted in some great periodicals, as well as um, some great pictures at, at the very least to break up your day on some of our social platforms, as well as some breaking news. So encourage folks to check us out there and find the, the latest ways to take action. And um, other than that, thank you so much all for, for being a part of this. And, uh, and we'll toss it back over to Monica. Thank you, Chris. And yeah, I just wanted to take a minute to really extend uh, my deepest thanks um, to you, John, for doing this program with us tonight, for sharing your words, sharing your music, sharing your stories, uh, and really reigniting um, what I hope um, is a, a renewed passion and a renewed sense of responsibility uh, in all of us to do what we can uh, when we can. And I know that we are going to um, really see what we can do when we work together over these next couple of weeks, months, and years and institute some great changes for not only the wild public lands and waters of Alaska, um, but hopefully for our planet as a whole. Um, And I just wanna again, thank all of you who continually tune in for our Geography of Hopes. Uh, I can't believe I was counting up. This is number 18, uh, which is great. And like I did mention, we do have number 19 on the books for next Tuesday, 7 p.m., same same time, same channel. Um, So you will be getting more information on that follow-up email um, to take a virtual trip to Southeast Alaska uh, in the Salmon Forest. So with that, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Um, And I look forward to seeing everyone next week.